the part of the circle that I get to talk about is uh, integration of crop and livestock systems. And as Aaron mentioned early on, I think that's an area where a lot of us probably have some familiarity. And because of that, uh, I decided to start by asking, what does it actually mean to be integrated? And I think all of us have pictures in our mind, but that picture can vary quite a bit. It could be as simple as using manure on a crop field, right? And it's integrating that crop and livestock production system. But uh, a definition I found that I thought was really helpful uh, was really to think about uh, agricultural management systems where the land is rotated over both either space or time between crop pasture and livestock uses, or at least a couple of those. So the land use had to vary, right? So putting manure on to a crop field is integrating it for livestock use or grazing that uh, corn stover. And a nice hierarchical arrangement of agricultural production systems that helped me think about what this might mean or might be was if we think about our basic agricultural production, and since I sit in Iowa, I normally think about that as corn and soybean rotations using commercial fertilizer as it's our most prominent system. Oftentimes, that's a simpler system, right? Where we know the inputs, we're buying commercial fertilizer, we have to do these timely field operations, yes, but uh, it's not making decisions on the fly that vary in terms of, should I plant something else or should I all of a sudden pivot and make corn silage instead? Uh, and you can make these systems more complex, right? So for instance, instead of using commercial fertilizers where we get a known composition of fertilizer and it's relatively easy to manage, it becomes a little more complex when we bring in a livestock such as pigs because we have to make the decision based on how full is my manure storage and how fit are field conditions for uh, a manure application activity is my nutrient source in balance and we can keep moving up that complexity scale and as we do our decisions get more dynamic right trying to respond to the weather for instance this year in Iowa uh, it's been very wet this spring we had a lot of uh, delays in getting our planting done um, and we tend to stick with corn and soybean rotations, but where I grew up in Wisconsin, as you get a little late, you might say, well, I still need forage for my dairy cows. I'm going to pivot to a sorghum forage this year instead of corn, right? Uh, my example of maybe doing that in Iowa would be adding cover crops into the rotation so that we can focus on grazing. And there's a trade-off between that complexity and risk, or at least spreading risk out over multiple things. Uh, if you're and not an integrated farm and you're just growing that corn and soybean rotation, you might think about that as a relatively high risk, right? If I don't have my corn make an ear this year, all of a sudden it's a completely lost crop. It's not a valuable product. If I had ruminants on the landscape where I could still harvest it as a forage, well, I can still get some value from it and due to diversification, even if I don't have that corn crop this year, well, thankfully I still have a cattle crop. Um, so I think there's a nice trade-off there between risk and complexity. And in some ways, it's nice for producers to say, I can simplify a few of these things because if you're farming, you have so many things that you're trying to balance and do uh, to try and make the system a little simpler makes a lot of sense. Uh, but it is a trade-off that takes takes and requires us to increase our risk profile a little bit. I did want to show a couple pictures of integration and, and both of these are sort of what I consider relatively standard or at least things that I see happening relatively frequently across the landscape. So some solid manure getting put on there as a, a fertilizer source after, after a corn crop to grow the next crop of corn. We can see some cattle out there grazing that corn stover, uh, providing some of that fertilizer back as, as they're, they're growing on our landscape. But there are people exploring what it means to be more integrated and what that might mean for our, our cropping systems. And one that I've uh, been following on Twitter or X is uh, there's a gentleman who goes by a stock cropper and he's been planting wide row corn, right? So he leaves a space between his rows of corn and then makes these solar powered grazing units that can be moved through the field, thinking about different ways to integrate that crop and livestock system in space rather than time, right? Because most of the examples that we think of as relatively standard are time examples. We grow our crop, there's a window that opens up and we can think about having livestock on it for a period of time. Uh, this one instead is, is saying we can do both at the same time. We just have to find a way to do that. And then I wanted to pivot a little bit. Mahmoud talked that we needed measures of integration and there are people out there that are thinking of them. A couple that I found in a few manuscripts were uh, fertilizer self-sufficiency or self-reliance circularity. So of all the fertilizer I need on my farm, what percent of that fertilizer am, am I really supplying with 
in this case, manures. Or we can think about it as recycling rate circularity. So I, I have all this manure, this stuff that was excreted from an animal. How good am I at getting that cycled back in useful ways, right? And that came from uh, a paper that I really like. And, and this is looking at it at a, at a bigger scale and sort of that flow through that Mahmoud mentioned, where we can think about this on just the land or with the livestock or following it all the way through food processing or food con consumption, where I have some waste food and maybe I'm composting it at my house or, or not, right? And, and how we're managing all those. And certainly as we integrate all those together, it gets more and more complicated. Uh, and for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna try and stick more towards just the farm scale as I move to my, my next slide here. But I wanted to do a couple examples of, of that and look at sort of examples of nutrient flow throughs. In this case, I'm gonna do nitrogen and we'll look at a slide for carbon. And the, the farm system that I wanted to look at was a wean to finish barn. Uh, since we raise a lot of pigs in Iowa, uh, on a deep pit, since that's our predominant manure management system, and then thinking about a corn soybean diet. I know we've switched to a lot of corn distillers grains diets with a little soybean meal. That gets a little bit more complicated, so I tried to stick to a simple one. And then how do we use that manure? And I just wanted to take a look at where nutrients started, where they flow. And I know this looks relatively linear, uh, but really my cropping acres here at the back end are tied to supplying uh, the feedstuffs I need. So I have enough corn acres to supply all my corn, enough soybean acres to supply all my soybean meal. And then I did have to cheat and say I was just buying some amino acids. But I was trying to tailor that system so we could think about it as a circle and, and use some of those circularity metrics. So a few things to point out. Based on the diet we formulated here, uh, we estimated we were feeding about 15 pounds of nitrogen to raise a pig from 25 pounds up to 200 and almost 80 pounds. And that pig in, in gaining that weight retains almost five and a half, a little bit more than five and a half pounds. So about 36% of the nitrogen we feed stays in the pig. The rest, we're assuming, gets excreted, put in that pit. And, and if you're doing that, you need some volatilization to occur. Certainly, as Mumu mentioned, there's practices that help with volatilization. We could think about uh, impermeable covers or acidifying. Uh, but I stuck with the standard system and said, we're going to lose about 30% of the nitrogen from the time it's excreted to the pig until we get it land applied. So I drew a, an arrow that said, well, that went up into the air and it's been lost from the system, trying to partition it into both ammonia and then direct and indirect N2O emissions. And then that means of all that stuff I had excreted, I get almost seven pounds to put back onto my crop. The soybean acres don't get any manure in my situation, or you don't get manure applied to them in this situation. They're not using any of that nitrogen. But if we did the same diagram for phosphorus, right, there would have been some residual phosphorus from the previous application that they're taking up. I did try and estimate sort of where nitrogen's going, how much I'm losing. Uh, so we needed about almost two bushels of soybeans to feed our pigs there. Uh, if you're doing that, hopefully those soybeans are fixing about five and a half pounds of nitrogen. The rest is coming from the soil. So they're, they're putting about seven pounds in the grain. And then we do have some nitrogen leaching losses and some denitrification losses that I tried to put estimates to, knowing that there's a fair amount of uncertainty about those estimates. We did get some corn following soybeans, right? So I matched the corn acres there to what we were growing with the soybean field and did sort of the same process. We need to put some nitrogen on, in this case, following optimum Iowa recommendations, we put on roughly 4.8 pounds of nitrogen in that manure and got somewhere around four, four pounds of nitrogen back in the grain with some of those going to losses, losses both to leaching and potentially denitrification losses. And then we had to do with the, the same with some continuous corn. I needed more continuous corn acres here. And for the first time I had to put in some supplemental fertilizer to make it work because I ran short of manure, right? I no longer had enough nitrogen to supply all the, the, the needs for that crop to make sure I had enough corn to feed my pig. Again, trying to estimate some of those losses. One thing that's sort of interesting in the system for me to at least think about, and I wanted to point out now, is when we look at what one of my circularity metrics says, it's gonna give us an interesting result. I was buying about three pounds of nitrogen with commercial fertilizer to make up for my corn. And I'm exporting about 5.6 pounds of nitrogen with my pig. And I'm adding just a little bit of synthetic nitrogen and amino acids that I'm buying. But that means I'm exporting more nitrogen in my product, my pig, than I'm purchasing, right? And some of that comes from soybeans fixing legumes and how you think about that legume as an input and handle it makes some difference in some of your calculations. We can do the same thing for carbon, and certainly when we think about the life cycle side of circularity, that's often what we're thinking about. I'm not going to read all of uh, my numbers here. You can sort of see what we're getting at, but how much carbon we had in, in the diet, and then how it's partitioning some to the pig, some to enteric fermentation in the pig, much lower than we'd have with a ruminant, but it's still there. Some just 
respired as CO2 is that pig's breathing. And then some of it ending up in the manure pit with multiple fates in the manure pit, right? Some getting to go to land application, some turning into methane and CO2 during the storage of the manure, which we may or may not be able to collect if we did something like an impermeable cover or put a digester in the system. But again, keeping it simple, thinking about deep pits and how it sort of partitions. Once we put it on the soil, yes, manure can help build soil health. Some of that can become soil carbon. Uh, but I, I was relatively unconfident about trying to partition that at this time because it depends on lots of things. Uh, so I put a lot of X's in there. And that's something that as we think about circularity and what we're really doing, we probably need to uh, find good ways to put numbers on to help people out with both their circularity and their life cycle analysis. And then I wanted to talk just a little bit about system efficiency. So when I think about system efficiency, it's sort of that desired output, in this case, a pig, compared to the inputs that I considered purchasing, right? So it was anything that I had to buy to make this system work. Uh, and that's why my nitrogen efficiency works out to more than 100%, right? I was exporting more nitrogen in that pig than I was purchasing with commercial fertilizer. That excess nitrogen uh, input that I need is really coming from using soybeans as a legume to get some of that nitrogen from the atmosphere, which I consider for free. But in some ways, it's an input, and we have to think about how we might handle that. When we look at some of those other metrics that I mentioned, sort of that fertilizer self-reliant circularity. So what percentage of the fertilizer am I providing? I did it for both nitrogen and phosphorus. And in this example, we get somewhere around 70% of all the nitrogen we needed and the phosphorus we needed from the manure, right? You could also think about how well were we doing in actually getting that stuff back to the field, right? And getting it into the feed stuff that we wanted. So with that nitrogen, since I have the ammonia volatilization during storage, some nitrogen losses during production, um, some denitrification occurring. My nitrogen efficiency in, in terms of how well I'm doing and getting it back to a feedstuff or that recycling rate efficiency, I'm, I'm only 40% efficient for nitrogen, a little better for phosphorus. In terms of being able to generate my, my feedstuff, I actually did relatively well, right? I got 100% of my carbon, 95% of my nitrogen, ma mainly just whatever I wasn't getting from the amino acids I purchased, and a fair amount of my phosphorus, 76%, with needing to buy some monocal to make up the difference. And I think when you start thinking about circularity metrics, those are some of the numbers that we can get. Certainly there's other metrics to think about. Mahmoud mentioned a few, sort of how many times does that nutrient flow through the circle might be a, a good way to think about it. Uh, these are the couple that I picked for illustrative purposes. And I just wanted to point out maybe that we used to think more about in terms of losses per pig, right? So how much ammonia volatilization nitrogen did I have or nitrate leaching per pig? or just that CO2 equivalent. And, and all those metrics have value. And I think we have to think strongly about when does each one tell us what we want to know and tell us something useful. Uh, certainly they both give us different concepts, uh, but there are a lot of things we can learn from, from both of them. And then I wanted to talk a little bit more about circularity. And this is one of the things that Mahmoud uh, pointed at with some of the graphics he made where he was showing operational separation between crop and livestock systems. Uh, I've been playing around with some metrics for quite a while in Iowa, trying to compare how much manure we make in each county relative to the crop nutrient need in that county. And that's what I'm really trying to illustrate here with a maps of Iowa from many different years, going back from 1974 uh, through 2012. I try and do this for every census of ag, so I do have some newer ones. I just didn't get them on this, this figure. And really what you're looking at is I tried to break it up in increments of 10%. So if you see a really dark green county, like you see in Southwest Iowa in some of the more modern years, only 10% of the nutrients that they need to support crop production in that area can actually be supplied from the livestock manure we have in that area after accounting for storage losses and availability. As you get to some of those lighter green counties, we move up in steps of 10 uh, until you finally get to some of those yellow and red counties where we can get sizable amounts of manure nutrients uh, to us that, that meet crop demand, right? So if you start to see counties in red, I'm estimating that you can get somewhere between 90 and 100% of their nutrient needs from crop production. So especially in, in that Northwest region, we tend to have a lot of manure available relative to crop production. And certainly those counties meet Iowa standards for how we need to do right now, but they are getting relatively manure rich. And if you think about this circularity metric where we want to do better about getting a greater percentage of our, our nitrogen to be circular and keep coming back into products that we can use or sell, what's the incentive for a farm to be more circular if I can't use that manure as a fertilizer resource in my area? Mahmoud showed some great options about thinking about 
turning it into other products that are hopefully more exportable. But that is one of the challenges that we will have to face as we think about some of these circularity metrics and how to help these farms become more circular. I think anytime you're talking about integration of crop and livestock systems, one of the, the big struggles is going to be how efficient we are at growing the crops that we're producing. How much nitrogen does it take relative to how much nitrogen is actually in that crop? Um, I know a couple states have been doing this. I, I looked at some maps of Nebraska as a function of time the other day for uh, nitrogen efficiency. And the, the version of nitrogen efficiency I'm showing here is just how many pounds of nitrogen we think we're adding uh, to the soil with commercial fertilizers in this case. So we ruled out manured fields and only looked at commercially fertilized fields relative to how many bushels of corn we grow. To help you give some perspective on what this number really means, there's about six tenths of a pound of nitrogen in a bushel of corn, right? So if you see uh, a county where the number is close to 0.6, that would be a county with really high nitrogen use efficiency. They're putting almost all the nitrogen they're putting on is coming back to us in that bushel of corn. If we're higher than that, only a smaller fraction of that nitrogen is coming back. Um, so I'm showing this two ways, right? On the left, you see a figure sort of estimating that for uh, corn following a soybean crop. On the right, for a corn following corn crop or a continuous corn crop. And there's a couple things that really jump out to me at this. Uh, planting that legume in the rotation, no surprise to anyone. Probably it helps us lower the amount of nitrogen we need per bushel of corn we're going to get from a rotation effect or a legume effect or, or whatever your site eight might call it. But that number, that ability to get some of those nutrients back in our cropping system is going to be really key to improving some of our livestock sustainability. So uh, it's easier to do with commercial fertilizers. That's why we're showing it that way in terms of doing some of the calculations. Uh, with manured fields, it's, it's a little bit harder just because we don't have maybe quite the level of data that we really need or, or we want to have to do that. We can estimate how much manure is available in a county, but it's a little bit harder to understand maybe how much other commercial fertilizers are, are they buying to, to use some for some manure. So we're trying to work out some of those. And with that, uh, I've finished my presentation. 